Hello, anatomy and physiology students. Welcome to your first online laboratory. This laboratory covers the anatomy of the endocrine system. And the endocrine system is a very important body system as it regulates different organs throughout the body through the production of hormones, which are chemical messengers. So for this lab, we're gonna take a look at the macroanatomy of the endocrine system and learn each of the major endocrine organs. We're also gonna take a look at the microanatomy of these organs so that we can better understand how they work. Okay, to start off with, we're gonna go through the major endocrine glands that can be seen on this dissectable Altae human torso. So first off, we have the brain. Now the brain is not an endocrine organ per se, but it does contain three endocrine organs we're gonna talk about, and those are the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, and the pineal gland. Next off, we have the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland is located on the Adam's apple, or larynx, and it's important for secreting the hormone thyroxin, which helps to regulate metabolic rate. The next gland here is the thymus. Now the thymus is not actually visible in this model, but suffice it to say the thymus is a gland that covers the heart and it secretes the hormone thymosin, which helps to stimulate the maturation of white blood cells. Next off, we have the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands are found superior to the kidneys and they secrete a variety of hormones, including epinephrine and aldosterone. And next we have, of course, the kidney itself. And many people forget that the kidney does have an endocrine function. In addition to filtering blood, the kidney also produces a hormone called erythropoietin. And erythropoietin stimulates the maturation and production of red blood cells. Okay, and the next organ we have is the pancreas. And the pancreas is both endocrine and exocrine in function. And what I mean here is that it produces endocrine hormones like insulin and glucagon, but it also produces exocrine products such as enzymes. So the endocrine products of the pancreas, again, are insulin and glucagon, and these are two hormones that help to regulate levels of blood glucose. Okay, and finally we have the gonads, and the gonads are important in producing hormones such as estrogen, progesterone in females, and testosterone in males. And these help to regulate the reproductive tract as well as regulate libido and also sexual maturation. All right, now that we've had an overview of the locations of the major endocrine organs, we're gonna go back and talk about each of these organs in detail. And for some of these organs, we're gonna show the microanatomy or histology and talk about how that affects the organ's function. So first off, let's look at the brain. The brain is, of course, a nervous tissue organ, but it also has three suborgans in there that have endocrine functions. And the most important of these is the hypothalamus. Now, as the name implies, hypo meaning below, this organ is located below the thalamus, which is right here. And the function of the hypothalamus, as far as the endocrine system goes, is to secrete releasing hormones to control the anterior pituitary, and also to generate nerve impulses to control the posterior pituitary. So in reality, the hypothalamus is in charge of the pituitary gland, and the pituitary gland is in charge of much of the other organs of the endocrine system. So you can think of the hypothalamus as the big boss. Next off, we have the pituitary gland. So the pituitary gland is second in command. It has two different lobes called the anterior and posterior pituitary, and they each have different functions. So let's take a look at the histology of this organ. You can see it looks like a yin and a yang symbol right here, and it's divided into two lobes called the adenohypophysis and the neurohypophysis, or the pars distalis and pars nervosa. So over here, we have the adenohypophysis or pars distalis, this is otherwise known as the anterior pituitary, and the anterior pituitary secretes seven different hormones, and these include growth hormone, follicle-stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, and adrenocorticotropic hormone. Now, these hormones are produced in the anterior pituitary and have effects on other endocrine glands. Therefore, they're called tropic hormones. Just a reminder that the pars distalis, or anterior pituitary, is controlled by the hypothalamus by the secretion of releasing hormones. So let's say we want to produce some growth hormone from our anterior pituitary. In that case, the message would first come from the hypothalamus, which is located above, and that message would be growth hormone releasing hormone. Once that growth hormone releasing hormone travels to the anterior pituitary, the anterior pituitary would then release the growth hormone, which would have effects on various organs of the body. All right, in contrast, the pars nervosa, or posterior pituitary, doesn't actually produce any hormones. It stores two hormones which are actually made in the hypothalamus, and these include oxytocin and ADH. Now, oxytocin is important for smooth muscle contraction. It stimulates the contraction of the uterine muscles, as well as the muscle tissue located in the breast tissue. And this is important for childbirth, as well as the lactation or milk letdown reflex, which is important during breastfeeding. 
The other hormone which is secreted by but not produced in the posterior pituitary is of course ADH. And ADH stands for antidiuretic hormone. So ADH helps to regulate water balance in the body and it's secreted by the hypothalamus and stored in the posterior pituitary. When the body becomes dehydrated, uh, nerve signals from the hypothalamus will tell us to release some of this ADH from our posterior pituitary. It will then travel to the kidneys and help to conserve water and reduce the amount of water that is lost in the urine. All right, so the big picture here is the pars distalis or anterior pituitary is controlled by releasing hormones secreted by the hypothalamus. In contrast, the pars nervosa or posterior pituitary is controlled by nerve impulses from the hypothalamus. Okay, the final endocrine gland we have in the brain is the pineal gland. Now the pineal gland secretes the hormone melatonin. You've probably heard of melatonin before and you may actually see it at the grocery store or at Long's Drug Store. So melatonin is a protein or amino acid hormone that helps to regulate circadian rhythms or wake sleep cycles. And so you can actually buy this in the store and some people debate whether it works or not, but people that are having problems sleeping can actually take exogenous melatonin to help correct any sleep disorders. All right, the histology of the pineal gland is rather homogenous and unimpressive. What you can see here is lots of pineal sites, and these pineal sites will secrete melatonin, and they do so in relation to light levels. So as we get closer to nighttime, the levels of melatonin production go up, and as we get closer to daytime, melatonin production goes down. So once again, melatonin helps to regulate our circadian rhythm or wake-sleep cycles. Okay, now we're gonna go back and talk about the thyroid gland again. Remember the thyroid gland is located on the Adam's apple or right up here on the larynx. And the thyroid gland we said is important in producing thyroxin, which regulates our basal metabolic rate. But we didn't talk about the other glands that are associated with the thyroid gland, and those are the parathyroid glands. So the parathyroid glands are located on the backside of the thyroid gland. They're very insignificant looking glands, but they are very, very important because they produce hormones that are responsible for regulating calcium levels in the body. And these hormones are parathyroid hormone. So parathyroid hormone is secreted when blood calcium levels decline, and it helps to uh, advance the activity of osteoclasts in the bone that break down that bone and free up blood calcium so that we have homeostasis in the body. So very, very important glands. All right, now let's take a look at the histology of the thyroid and parathyroid. If we're looking out at low magnification, we can see the difference right here between the thyroid and the parathyroid. Again, a thyroid gland is a much more massive gland. As we're gonna see, it's made up of little follicles that are filled with fluid or colloid. On the other hand, we can see our parathyroid right here, which is a much denser gland, and that is the gland that secretes parathyroid hormone. All right, now we're gonna take a more detailed 400X magnification view of the thyroid gland. And what we can see is the thyroid gland is made up of these repeating structures, which are called thyroid follicles. Now a follicle here is a sac of epithelial tissue that is secreting something. And what we're secreting is something called thyroglobulin. Thyroglobulin, which is in the inside here, is a colloid. And this colloid is the basis or precursor for making thyroxin, which again helps to regulate our basal metabolic rate. So the colloid here is made by follicular cells, which make up the follicle and surround the colloid, but we also have parafollicular cells on the outside of the uh, follicles as well. Okay, now let's go back and talk about the thymus. Now remember, we can't actually see the thymus on most anatomical models because it would obscure or cover the heart. Now in reality, the thymus is a very, very small gland and it gets proportionally smaller as we get older. So if we take a look at a thymus of a young person, like a toddler, it's gonna to be fairly big, but as we age, the thymus gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So the thymus has a couple roles. Uh, one, it helps to regulate immunocompetence of white blood cells, but two, it also produces the hormone thymosin that helps to uh, regulate uh, the rate of maturation of those white blood cells. And we'll talk more about the function of the thymus when we get to the chapter on the immune system. Okay, now let's take a look at the microanatomy or histology of the thymus. And the thymus is broken up into repeated structures which are called thymic lobules. A lobule here is just like a little lobe. And what we can see is each of these lobules is made up of two different areas. There is a cortex and a medulla. In any organ, the cortex is actually the outside and the medulla is on the inside. Now, remember the thymus here for the endocrine system secreted the, secreted the hormone thymosin, which is important in maturation of white blood cells, but it has other functions as well, and we'll learn about those in a few more chapters. 
All right, now we're gonna move down into the upper part of the abdominal cavity to cover the organs of the adrenal glands, the kidneys, and finally, the pancreas. So let's start off with the kidney itself. The kidney, of course, is an organ which is important for filtering blood and regulating our water and salt balance in the body. But again, the kidney is also important for secreting a hormone called erythropoietin, or EPO. EPO is made by the cells, and they're responsible for secreting uh, EPO when levels of oxygen in the bloodstream decline. So when we become hypoxic, our EPO uh, concentration goes up, and that stimulates the production of red blood cells in the red bone marrow. Okay, unlike the pineal gland, kidney histology is actually quite fascinating. Now, we're not gonna spend a lot of time right now talking about the microscopic structures there because we're gonna cover those in detail when we get to the urinary system. But what you can see is lots and lots of tubules in here, and these tubules are part of something called a nephron, and a nephron is the smallest functional unit of the kidney, and it includes things like this right here, which is the glomerulus, which is surrounded by the Bowman's capsule. Now these aren't responsible for actually manufacturing the hormone erythropoietin, but this is what kidney histology looks like. All right, next off, we're gonna take a look at the adrenal gland. Now the adrenal gland is located superior to the kidney, and the adrenal gland is divided into two different regions. We have an outer adrenal cortex. Remember, the cortex is the outside of the organ, and we have an inner adrenal medulla. Now both the cortex and the medulla make different hormones, and we're gonna talk about those when we get to the histology. Okay, what you can see here is a large 4x view of the histology of an adrenal gland, and this is in particular, I think, from a mongoose. So we have an outer adrenal cortex, which is located here, and an inner adrenal medulla. Now, each of these regions makes different hormones. The adrenal cortex makes hormones such as aldosterone, which is important in the regulation of salt and water balance. It also manufactures cortisol, which helps to suppress inflammation and depress the function of the immune system. On the inside, however, we have the adrenal medulla, and the adrenal medulla makes one hormone, that is epinephrine and actually norepinephrine as well. So these are catecholamine hormones which stimulate the body's fight or flight response. So if you ever get really scared, almost get in a car accident or something like this, you'll feel this major surge of epinephrine which causes your heart rate to go up, which causes your pupils to dilate, all this stuff that we talked about in Anatomy and Physiology 141. So all of that happens right here through the secretion of epinephrine and norepinephrine from the adrenal medulla. Now if we take a look at the adrenal cortex, which is the outer part of the gland, we see that it's divided into three zones. A zona glomerulosa, a zona fasciculata, and a deeper zona reticularis. Each of these zones is responsible for manufacturing a different hormone. So the most superficial layer is the zona glomerulosa, and the zona glomerulosa secretes mineral corticoids such as the hormone aldosterone. Below that, we have the zona fasciculata, and the zona fasciculata secretes the hormone cortisol. Now cortisol, again, reduces the inflammation and also suppresses the immune system. If you ever have any drugs that you've taken like cortisol or even hydrocortisone, these are derivatives from this cortical hormone. Next off, we have the zona reticularis, and the zona reticularis is important for the production of androgens. And these androgens have multiple functions in the body, but in particular, in females, they help to stimulate libido or sexual response. Okay, now that we've covered the anatomy and endocrine function of the kidneys and adrenal glands, let's take a zoom back out to the abdominal cavity and take a look at this very important endocrine organ known as the pancreas. Again, the pancreas is an important endocrine and exocrine organ. Now, what's the difference between endocrine and exocrine? Well, exocrine glands secrete products through ducts into something. So they have ducts or passageways to a body surface. So we have ducts in here that help to get our enzymes produced by the pancreas, which are exocrine, uh, eventually deep down into the duodenum, which is part of the GI tract. On the other hand, endocrine glands lacked ducts or passageways to the body surface. So how do hormones get from where they're produced to where they wanna go? Well, they simply diffuse through body fluids and eventually hitch a ride on the bloodstream. So the two hormones produced by the pancreas that we need to worry about are insulin and glucagon. Insulin helps to stimulate the uptake of glucose from the cells, so it lowers blood sugar, whereas glucagon helps to free up more blood sugar uh, from the liver, from the muscles, and helps to keep blood sugar levels from going too low. So what does the pancreas look like histologically? Well, histologically, it looks kind of like the kidney, except we don't really have the tubules in here. 
Now, it's important to realize that the majority of tissue in the pancreas is not, in fact, endocrine, it's exocrine. So this is all acinar or acinar tissue out here, and that's responsible for making enzymes that we'll learn about when we get to the digestive system. On the other hand, right here, you can see a very distinctive structure called the islets of Langerhans. And the islets of Langerhans is very important for secreting the hormones insulin and glucagon. So they contain both alpha and beta cells, which secrete different hormones. Again, insulin helps to depress the blood sugar, bring it back down from going too high, and glucagon helps to elevate blood sugar. So be sure to identify uh, the islets of Langerhans in any histological sections you have of the pancreas gland. All right, now that we've covered the organs that are in the upper part of the abdominal cavity, we're going to go down and talk about the endocrine organs that are located in the pelvis. And these are the gonads, that is the ovaries and the testes. Okay, let's talk about the gonads of the female reproductive system, and they're called ovaries. Now, ovaries are important for a variety of reasons. They produce the female gametes, which are known as oocytes, but they also produce two hormones which are important in regulation of the timing of the female reproductive tract. And these hormones are estrogen and progesterone. So if we take a look at the histology of an ovary, what we can see in here is lots and lots of repeated structures here called uh, follicles. And these are called ovarian follicles. Now remember back to the thyroid, I said that a follicle is a sac of epithelial tissue that is secreting something. In this case, this sac of epithelial tissue is important for secreting the hormones estrogen and progesterone. Now initially, as these oocytes are developing, they're being stimulated by something called FSH, or follicle stimulating hormone, which comes from the anterior pituitary. That causes the follicles to grow larger and larger and larger. And as they do, we get this ring of follicular cells around there, and those follicular cells are important for secreting estrogen. Estrogen is important for a variety of reasons in the female reproductive tract. It helps to set the timing. It also helps to stimulate the maturation of the oocytes as well. Now, after these oocytes are ovulated under the direction of LH from the anterior pituitary, this ovarian follicle will become something called a corpus luteum, and the corpus luteum will secrete progesterone, and progesterone helps to maintain the uterine lining and prevent menstruation so that we can eventually carry that embryo to term as a fetus. Okay, and finally, we're on our last endocrine gland, which is the gonads of the male reproductive system, which are known as testes. You can call them testes, which is plural, or testis, which is singular. Do not say testicle, because that's just not really a word. Okay, so the testes are important for a variety of reasons. They produce the male gametes, which of course are called sperm or spermatozoa, but they also produce hormones called testosterone. So let's take a look at the histology of the testis and talk about what's in there. First of all, you'll see these large circular repeating structures, which are transverse sections of a seminiferous tubule. Now, seminiferous tubules are where we produce the sperm, and eventually those sperm are going to be shed in here to the lumen of the seminiferous tubule. But what you can see outside the tubule is something called lytic cells or interstitial cells. Now, lytic cells or interstitial cells are important because they secrete testosterone under the direction of LH. So LH, or luteinizing hormone from the anterior pituitary, stimulates these cells to produce testosterone. And why do we need testosterone? Well, we need testosterone for spermatogenesis, sperm production, but we also need it for male libido, sexual arousal, etc., and also for development and maintenance of male secondary sex characteristics. All right, you've reached the end of this mini lecture on the anatomy and microanatomy of the endocrine system. Now, in addition to reviewing this lecture, be sure to complete any exercises I've given you in lab, and also make sure you read the included chapters in your lab manual and histology manual. And as always, if you have any questions, drop me an email or send me a text. Aloha.